Hi guys, this is uh, Project 6, Statistical Exercises. I want to talk about uh, time series analysis. So the idea here is just to give you a taste of how you deal with time series data. It turns out there is a very rich collection of packages and procedures that people have developed for dealing with time series. What I want to do is just introduce you to the concept and also give you a chance to get some data, analyze it in terms of time series behavior, and um, learn how to just use the basic functionalities of pandas and time series. So um, I'm going to go ahead and import the usual suspects here. And I want to point out that uh, one thing you can do is go directly to the internet and grab data right into uh, pandas. So for example, if I if I go to this URL, you'll notice it's um, it's data. Let's see if I can. Whoops. Grab some of it here, and let me just pop it into a text editor, and you can see it's uh, it's space delimited, so it doesn't. This text editor shows dots when there are spaces, and it shows tab characters when there are tabs. So this is not tab delimited, it's space delimited. But um, Pandas is pretty smart about that, and so let's see how you handle that. Basically, I, I define the URL. I say, look, I want you to go to that URL. I don't have a header there, but I know the names of the columns are year, month, and the Arctic Oscillation value. This is data about the Arctic Oscillation. Let's uh, take a look at that link real quick. And this describes what the Arctic Oscillation is and sort of how it comes to be and so on. Um, I'm not that interested in learning about the Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation at the moment. I'm really just interested in how do I deal with data that has year and month values. So the way you tell it that you want to delimit on white spaces. You set delimit white spaces true. And then the other thing is this has year and month, but it doesn't have a day. And so I'm going to go ahead and just set the day column to one. So we'll just assume that the data is for the the first of every month, basically. It's monthly data. And so uh, let's look at that. If I go ahead and run that, it shows me I've got year, month, and then I've got day. So um, the uh, I can convert those to dates, like so, and then uh, by saying to date time. And date time is an object that's meant for keeping dates and times. And if I create a new data frame called AO based on the values pulled in from the internet, but using an index of dates, an interesting thing happens. When I plot it, is intelligent about how it displays the dates. It realizes those are, um, it would be crazy to try to show every day on this scale, so it, it knows to go in and show me years. But I can also index on years. So I can say, I just want to look from 1980 to 1990, and it does the right thing. It goes from 1980 to 1990, and, uh, and that's amazing, right? These are one year increments and it shows all 12 months in between. Um, I can also say the fifth month of 1980 to the third month of 1981, right? And it's going to show me that. It goes from May of 1980 up through March of 1981. So it's super smart about how it handles dates. So that's that's cool. Now we can also get the same kind of data uh, for the North Atlantic Oscillation, we can do the same process. And uh, and then you can even plot, say I can plot the Arctic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation in um, a single graph by using the subplots option. And I could also take the difference between the two. You can see that now I've added a new column which has the difference between the Atlantic Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation. I could plot that if I wanted to. Um, 
let's just show how that would work. If I could say uh, A N O A, no A O N A O dot uh, diff dot plot. I think that will work. Yep. So that's the difference between the two. You see how that works? Okay. Very exciting. And then when you're done with it, if you don't want it anymore, you can delete it and it goes away. Okay. You can also say, what's the, uh, tell me about these columns in the data frame, and it will tell you how many data points, the mean, standard deviation, quartiles, and so on. So it gives you all kinds of interesting information that way. Um, you can also resample the data uh, annually. So for example, if I say resample A, that means annually, and it means take the average. So it's going to take the average of each year, excuse me, and tell you that. Okay, so that's that's a little bit of a smoother, you know, looking data set by doing those annual averages. Um, and you can also look at max and min annually. So the blue is the mean, and then the max is the green, and the min is the orange. So it gives you some sense of the range of the values. Um, and then you can also... Uh, plot those out individually on their own graphs as well. And, and that might also be useful. So just to give you a sense of like different kinds of presentation sort of graphs you can make. You can also do a rolling mean. So if I want to do a rolling window mean, every I want to take the average of every 12 months and plot that monthly. So that's what that is. It's a rolling average. And uh, Let's see, here I'm doing it, uh, oh, I'm looking at the correlation between the North Atlantic Oscillation relative to the uh, Atlantic Oscillation, and it gives me a correlation coefficient, and it looks like they're pretty highly correlated. The correlation coefficient doesn't go below 0.5. What is a correlation coefficient? Well, <coughs> we can talk about this in class a little bit more, but basically it's the the correlation coefficient is what you get when you take the average of the product of the two. So if they if they tend to move together, that average product will be positive. If they tend to move oppositely, so when one's positive and one's neg when one's positive, the other tends to be negative, then the correlation coefficient will end up being negative. Um, <coughs> and it's scaled by the standard deviation. So we'll talk about that in class. I don't want to get into that too much right now. But the point is you can calculate it easily and you can graph it. <coughs> um, you can also uh, calculate the correlation coefficients of the two different columns. Um, each is correlated perfectly with itself, but the correlation coefficient of them with one another is about 0.6. And uh, what I want to also point out is that we can use Bayesian inference to get a long-term trend. So I can calculate the um, rolling mean in terms of uh, days. I can get the rolling mean as a function of time, and I can calculate the number of days. I want to get a linear function of time that isn't dates anymore. So I got to go back from dates and convert into time. And then I can actually rescale that. So time is going to be a scale time. This t is a scale time from 0 to 1. And the value of the rolling mean, I'm going to scale that according to the standard deviation. So in this case, the v of 0 would be the mean. v of plus 1 would be one standard deviation more positive than the mean. v minus 1 would be one standard deviation more negative than the mean. If I graph that, you can see that there's clearly a trend. The time goes from 0 to 1. So 0 is the beginning of the data set. 1 is the end of the data set. And the values are all scaled by the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean is in the middle, 0. This is 1 standard deviation, 2 standard deviation, 3 standard deviations from the mean for that whole data set. And here I'm going to make a model. Uh, y is equal to m times t plus b. So it's just a straight line model that tries to see what the trend is in the data. You can see there clearly seems to be a trend. Let's, let's use Bayesian inference to try to identify the, those parameters, the slope and the intercept of that trend. So here it goes.
looks like it finished. You can see it, it looks like it went pretty well. I've got a nice intercept that's negative. That's consistent with what I remember from the data. The intercept should be down here. It should have a positive slope. Slope is clearly positive. It looks like it's around 1.25 or so. And the, uh, the noise is big. It's like 1. Okay. So we'll go ahead and sample that for the posterior. And then we make a few graphs using the uh, posterior distribution. So go ahead and get that post-predictive posterior check data. Okay, we'll look at the keys. We've got the M and the B and the out. We'll notice that the M and the B are just numbers, 4,000 numbers, but the out is each, each instance of out has 843 data points. So if I graph that guy, you'll see um, there's my trend, right? With the inner with the slope and the uh, intercept and then the noise level is quite high. Now the noise from the posterior doesn't really look like it's mimicking the actual data. So to, to really analyze the detailed time dependence of the actual data we need some more sophisticated techniques. That's really beyond the scope of what we can do in this class but there's lots of interesting packages out there. If you're interested in this kind of thing I'd encourage you to look at uh, the exercise for this week is simply to go out on the internet, find some data that's a time series, and try to make some head, some sense out of it. Use uh, some of the graphs that I've showed you how to make here. You can do some Bayesian inference if you wish to. It's not a requirement. Just I just need you to do some kind of analysis to make some conclusions about the data. Is it going up? Is it going down? What, what can you tell me about it? Um, and that's all there is to it. Okay, we'll talk to you guys soon.